of today's meeting. And we have a busy schedule, so let's start straight ahead. Uh, the next speaker is uh, Laura Lopez. So Laura, if you can uh, share your screen, please. Yep. 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 Thank you, Laura. So go ahead. Okay, so thank you very much uh, for giving me the opportunity to, uh, to uh, participate to this conference. Unfortunately, uh, not in presence in uh, Sao Paulo. Um, okay, I will start my video. Um, I, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, feebly interacting massive particle as non-cold dark matter and actually also not even feebly interacting massive particles. So what I'm, the results I'm going to show you are, uh, have been inspired by uh, two work, one that has been published in July and one that hopefully will soon be uh, put on archive. In collaboration with uh, Yazon Baldes, Lorenzo Calibi, Quentin Descamps, Francesco Derramo, Diana Hooper, Sam Junius, and Alberto Mariotti. And I would like to emphasize that Quentin Descamps and Sam Junius are two uh, PhD students currently that did a uh, big chunk of the works presented here. Okay, so I think we have had now uh, several talks where we have seen that uh, we can account for uh, dark matter on uh, various scales, uh, including uh, very high scales where we can have actually primordial black hole as a candidate for dark matter. Uh, in my talk, I'm going to discuss the case of feebly interacting massive particles that are usually represented in uh, this uh, range of scales. Now, um, I'm also uh, going to add up uh, to these uh, feebly interacting massive particles from actually Friedzin, uh, the case of not even feebly interacting particles arising from the evaporation of primordial black holes. So my primordial black holes here are just a source for uh, dark matter and are not going to be considered as candidate for dark matter. What is the link between the two is uh, actually non-cold dark matter. So what do I mean by non-cold dark matter? Uh, the one that you know, the you, you certainly already uh, know of is thermal warm dark matter. Thermal warm dark matter that free streams from over dense to under dense region and somehow in this way erase uh, small inhomogeneities I mean, inhomogeneity is on small scales. So when you look at uh, the, the, the power spectrum, here is the dimensional power spectrum as a function of the wave number uh, or the inverse of a scale. So large scales are on that side and small scales on that side. Uh, you end up with the blue continuous line for cold dark matter. Now, when you go to small scales of the other galactic scales, let's say, you have actually still some freedom uh, to account for data between scenarios that would be I mean, cold dark matter or actually non-cold dark matter, including the warm dark matter case, which free streams and can give rise to an exponential cut into uh, your dimensionless power spectrum. There are many other possibilities to, uh, to have dark matter free streaming uh, and there are also other possibilities to give a cut in the power spectrum more generally that you can also put into uh, the name non-cold dark matter, including, for example, some dark matter species that could couple to light uh, photons or dark photons, let's say, or neutrinos would suffer collisional damping and potentially end up with uh, this kind of signature in, uh, the, in the, the small scale power spectrum. Okay, so. Uh, how do we, how can we characterize uh, this cut in the power spectrum for uh, some set of non-cold dark matter scenario, not all the scenarios? You can actually uh, typically look at the ratio between the power spectrum of your non-cold dark matter uh, favorite model to the power spectrum of the cold dark matter. And it will typically end up as something that is, is, is one uh, at, uh, at large scale. I mean, you, could account, you should account for data that, that are very well accounted for by cold dark matter on large scales, but on small scales, you would have some, some, some cut in your power spectrum that will be controlled by three parameters. Uh, say alpha, beta, gamma. So this is the, the, the terminology uh, introduced in Moja et al. in 2017, um, where beta and gamma are just some dimensionless exponents 
while alpha has the dimension of the scale and it can be uh, thought of as a breaking scale in the power spectrum. So generally, you will be looking at this ratio of power spectrum referred as uh, uh, the, to as uh, the, the transfer function. And this transfer function can be expressed in terms of a, a limited number of parameters, typically directly related to your uh, to the, to the, the, the physics of your, 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 your non-cold dark matter scenario. And this will be the case of uh, non-thermal dark matter arising from freezing and primordial black hole evaporation. Now, how do you test this cut in the power spectrum? Uh, a very good test of this uh, non-cold uh, dark matter scenario is to look at uh, lima and alpha power flux uh, data. Uh, so what happened is that you can have bright sources far away from us, typically between redshift two and five in the form of quasars that are going to emit light on the the way of light between the quasar and us, there are hydrogen clouds that are going to give rise to a series of absorption lines in the uh, in the quasar spectra, which are referred to uh, Lima and alpha forests. And uh, by by studying these uh, these uh, these absorptions and also uh, mod, I mean, then you have to compare to uh, your favorite dark matter model. And in order to do that, actually, you cannot just use a linear transfer function, but you actually have to run hydrodynamical simulation, which are costly. So they have been done for a few kind of model, and in particular for thermal warm dark matter. And in the latter case, you end up with a, a limit on the possible masses for your thermal warm dark matter that ranges between 2 and 5 kV currently, depending uh, on what is assumed in order to extract this data. OK. so. And this is about non-cold dark matter scenario. Now, let me uh, tell you a little bit more about the typical non-cold dark matter models I'm going to be interested in. And I mean, the point also of this, uh, I mean, of showing you two models is also to tell you just simply that this is an interesting feature that is te testable potentially for very feebly coupled dark matter. Uh, scenario where you have more difficulties to test them with uh, particle physics, let's say experiment. Okay, so freezing. We already heard about freezing early. I mean, earlier today. So uh, you compare to freeze out. You have actually the possibility to produce. Uh, to to. I mean, I'm going to assume that there is no dark matter initially uh, in the bath, and that it's going to be produced actually through a decay, maybe contrary to a previous talk, of a bath particle into, let's say, the dark matter and some other particle that would be, um, for example, a standard model particle. I'm, I'm, I'm taking the reference to decay, but actually you can do the same kind of exercise with scattering, obviously. Um, when you produce uh, your dark matter slowly at some point when your bath particle get out of equilibrium, uh, sorry, become non-relativistic and its abundance is suppressed, extremely suppressed, you end up with a fixed amount of uh, density of dark matter that actually uh, is directly proportional to the rate of production of your dark matter, inversely proportional to the square of the bath particle mass and uh, proportional to the mass of the dark matter. I have put some numbers into it, 10 kV for the dark matter mass, uh, bath ma particle of 600 GV. Uh, you end up with a rate of 10 to the minus 15 GV in order to account for all the dark matter corresponding in this case to, let's say if I was considering a Yukawa interaction here uh, of the order of 10 to the minus eight for the coupling. So very suppressed compared to weak couplings. Now, if I take the same formula, and I express it in terms of the proper decay length. And I plot here the proper decay length as a function of the mass of my dark matter particle. The blue line here would correspond to where I would expect my dark matter to sit if it's produced through freezing. So if it respects this, uh, this, uh, this relation for 600 uh, GeV mass of the bath particle decaying, I see that I typically expect proper decay length of the order of two centimeters. So if my bath particle is actually charged under a standard model gauge group, I can expect to produce it, for example, in colliders. And due to the very small Yukawa interaction I have here, or you, the small coupling in general involved, I can expect to have a long lived particle at collider with a typical uh, displacement that could be tested uh, through displaced vertices uh, at colliders. 
In the same region of the parameter space, when I look at the, the, the x axis here, I see that I actually end up with masses of particle of a few kV, which rings the bell of known cool dark matter, at least in the thermal uh, warm dark matter scenario, that could actually lead, I mean, to give rise to a complementary uh, signature in cosmology uh, with this cat in the power spectrum. Now, uh, I, I, maybe I didn't insist enough uh, on this, but thermal warm dark matter is supposed to be in thermal equilibrium originally, while uh, free films from freezing are never supposed to have been in equilibrium in the early universe. So you cannot just use the thermal warm dark matter constraint and apply it to your favorite model of FIMS. You actually, I mean, the first thing you should do is actually to look at what is uh, the velocity distribution function uh, that arises from production uh, of your dark matter. You just take uh, the Boltzmann equation for production of your dark matter. Here I show you the Q square. Uh, so Q is just the momentum uh, rescaled by, the, by a temperature. Uh, and I show you here Q square, so the momentum square time uh, this distribution, the velocity distribution function in the case of freezing from decay. Um, with the purple line, I show you the final uh, distribution. And as a comparison, I show you uh, Fermi Dirac uh, thermal distribution. And what you see here is actually uh, freezing from film from decay end up with a distribution, a velocity distribution that is actually not that different from uh, a thermal particle. Actually, it's just shifted somehow. So what this tells you is that in the case that I was considering, my particle uh, from freezing is actually inheriting some thermal-like uh, distribution function from the bath mediator. If I plug this velocity distribution function into a Boltzmann code that I is going to look at, I mean, that is going to look at the evolution of uh, density perturbation in the early universe. So in particular, we have been using uh, the Boltzmann code uh, class, you end up being able to extract the famous transfer function, which should show a cut in the power spectrum if you have non cold dark matter scenario. So with the dashed line, I show you the case of thermal warm dark matter. With continuous line, I show you the case of dark matter from freezing from decay. Okay, and so you see that, for example, a thermal warm dark matter with a mass of 4.65 kV would correspond to a dark matter from freezing with a mass of uh, uh, something like 12 kV. So the purple line compared to the red line, they are very similar. So what I'm going to use now is that uh, if I'm interested uh, in a model of uh, dark matter arising from freezing from decay, uh, the typical uh, lower bond on my uh, dark matter mass should be of order of 10 kV or so. And I mean, I showed you, I mean, this is uh, our result from using Boltzmann code, but this, this, this result is older from Boulet Manan and collaborator from 2017. And I mean, other people have been working on that. Uh, very recently, we have two papers last week on this topic from Guillermo Ballesteros and Francesco de Ramo and collaborators. All right. So now, how do I connect that uh, to other possibilities to test my FIMP from freezing? Uh, I'm just going to illustrate that in the case of a leptophilic scenario, where I am going to consider a Yukawa coupling between a charge scalar that will play the role of my bath particle, a dark matter candidate, which is a Majorana fermion, and uh, that is coupling to a lepton. In this case, this bath particle, the, the charge scalar, can actually be produced, it's charged at, uh, at colliders. And actually, uh, due to the feeble coupling that would be involved, that is lambda chi here, would give rise to potentially uh, long-lived charge scalars at colliders. Um, it can give rise to different signatures. So either it crosses completely uh, the, 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 uh, the detector and give rise to long uh, proper decay length, or it can actually uh, still inside the detector decay and give rise to uh, kink tracks or displaced lepton, which are constrained already by uh, um, Atlas and CMS searches. Uh, notice that with the lines here, the continuous lines, I show you where I've given a certain proper decay length and, and mediator mass 
where uh, my dark matter, for example, of 10 keV is giving rise to the right radical abundance. So what you see here is that when I look, I add up uh, the Lehman alpha constraint on this plot, uh, I am actually erasing uh, the possibility, I mean, th the place where I would have been able to test my dark matter due to a displaced decay in collider, I'm actually already cut by uh, cosmology constraint, which seems to be a bit uh, depressing at first sight, okay? We thought we had complementarity, we could look at in two ways, but actually, I mean, somehow, I mean, it looks like at least displaced uh, searches that could give us some more information on the dark matter scenario are a bit uh, already excluded by uh, cosmology constraint. But this opens the possibility also to look at a modified early universe history, for example, with an early matter dominated era with low reheating temperature. And in the latter case, you can actually check that you open up the parameter space uh, with low uh, uh, proper decay length uh, that could actually uh, be tested complementarily to a Lehman alpha constraint and still be able to potentially, you would have a displaced event that collider that you, uh, you would like to, uh, to understand in, 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 in the term of a dark matter model of, of giving rise to the dark matter uh, in the, uh, through freezing from, I mean, decay or scatterings. And uh, it looks at first sight to be impossible with normal cosmology, but with an early matter dominated era, it would be uh, potentially possible. Okay, so now I'm going to consider uh, the case of a, a dark matter that is even more feebly coupled, not coupled at all through uh, particle interactions, but actually only gravitationally and arise from primordial black hole evaporation. We have seen these kind of plots previously in the talks where we have the fraction of dark matter in the form of black hole as a fraction of the black hole mass. And this is well constrained, I mean, depending on who you talk to, uh, depending on the, on the, on the different uh, sources. But I'm not interested into these ranges of primordial black hole mass. I'm actually interested into uh, the range of primordial black hole mass that are much lower than this usual plot you have seen. So I'm interested to, of, into black hole mass between 10 to the minus one and 10 to the eight gram that would have fully evaporated before BBN and give rise to uh, the, a certain dark matter population that only interacts gravitationally uh, with the rest of the world. In terms of Planck units, I'm interested in black hole mass between 10 to the four and 10 to the 13 Planck masses. Now, as I said, this is a very small primordial black hole can actually uh, evaporate uh, via Hawking radiation and uh, give rise to standard model particles, but also extra potential dark matter candidates. I'm going to consider the case where I have rel relatively light dark matter, which means by light with a mass smaller than the initial black hole mass. Okay. And actually, it is already well known that these kind of particles can behave like non-thermal, uh, non-cold dark matter. Um, some estimation of uh, the cut in the power spectrum, or essentially the free streaming length, has been done in the in the past. We have been considering uh, the full distribution function uh, that arises from uh, evaporation. Uh, this the distribution, of, uh, this velocity distribution function, so this f tilde x, I mean, x you recognize, it's very similar to my previous q, so it's kind of momentum rescaled by a temperature. f tilde x com corresponds to this q square fq I was showing you before, which integrated over the momentum is nothing but a number. The, of particle, okay? So if I integrate out below this curve, I end up with the number of particles I have been producing from a black hole. Uh, these curves are uh, independent of the mass of the black hole. So whole, whatever the mass of the black hole, I'm going to get uh, the same kind of uh, velocity distribution for my light particles. And uh, uh, the one that is interesting, I mean, the one that corresponds uh, from uh, black hole evaporation uh, in the range of mass I was uh, telling you before, is the purple curve. So what you see compared to a thermal uh, distribution is that actually we have a higher velocity tail and we also have the maximum shifted to uh, lower uh, momenta. 
Now, even though we have these uh, small differences compared to the blue curve that is a thermal Fermi Dirac distribution, we, when you plug this velocity distribution uh, into uh, a Boltzmann code, you actually can verify that your typical transfer function is again an exponential cut in the power spectrum, and that this cut depends uh, essentially on what is uh, the mass of your black hole. So in order to do this transfer function, I assume that uh, all the dark matter arising from a black hole uh, is in the form of uh, this uh, very, uh, non, I mean, not even feebly interacting massive particle. And I'm assuming, so, yes? So Laura, you have around five minutes, OK? Thank you very much. Uh, so what you see here is that if I fix the mass of my dark matter to 1 GV, and I compare the curves uh, for this, uh, dark matter rising from primordial, primordial black hole evaporation to the case of uh, warm dark matter. So here you have the 3 keV cut of the warm dark matter. I see that uh, the higher the mass of the black hole that spits out this dark matter, the more fast she will go. And uh, at the end of the day, we end up with a completely excluded uh, case of non-cold dark matter scenario. Uh, so for 1 GV, you see that actually 10 to the 10 is at the limit. Uh, you can, uh, we have been extracting a very general uh, formula in terms, again, of this alpha, beta, gamma parametrization. Uh, and you can actually, uh, for a fixed value of your Lehman alpha constraint that we take equal to 3 KV here, you can typically exclude uh, dark matter arising from primordial evaporation of 2 GV for a black hole mass of 10 to the 10 uh, M Planck. Okay, good. So now where does these uh, primordial black holes come from? Uh, you have multiple possibilities. Here we have been uh, considering the case of uh, primordial black hole during radiation domination era with an initially large density perturbation at sufficiently small scales that is going to collapse into a black hole uh, with a mass uh, that goes as one over uh, the horizon uh, to the cube. Okay. Um, these kind of uh, primordial black hole uh, are constrained uh, from a bunch of, uh, of from a bunch of things. First of all, I said that they are generated from uh, after inflation. So I mean, they should arise after inflation, meaning that their masses should typically be uh, larger than 10 to the 4 m Planck. So this was the lower limit I mentioned in my first slide on this topic. Why they should have evaporated before BBN? I don't want uh, this black, primordial black hole to be still around or to mess up BBN. So I need the masses to be lower than uh, 10 to the- Can you speak closer to the mic, please? Sorry? Can you speak closer to the mic? Because I cannot hear you very well. Ah, okay. Sorry, it's a bit late <laughs> for that. You hear me better? No, sometimes I can, sometimes it, the, the, the voice is a bit weaker. Oh, sorry. I'm really sorry for that. Uh, okay, so sorry. Um, uh, okay, so these were the limitation of my parameter space. Now, uh, in order to uh, go further, I also have to uh, in input somehow what is the, 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 the fraction of primordial black hole I had initially at the time of formation. Um, I'm going to consider as an example, a very small uh, fraction of primordial black hole originally. And within this setup, I can draw what would typically be the value of the dark matter mass versus uh, black hole mass that I need in order to account for all the dark matter in the universe. And this, is, uh, this corresponds to the red line. Everything above the red line is excluded because I would overclose the universe uh, with, um, with uh, these, uh, these parameters. Um, you see that there is a different way of going on the left and the right of this beta critical uh, line. It's actually this, this uh, value of, uh, of masses of black holes separate two regime. One where uh, primordial black holes are always in a, evaporating in a radiation dominated era, while on the other side, we have primordial black hole that will evaporate uh, in a matter dominated era. 
Um, in these two cases, so you have a different behavior, behavior of uh, mass versus black hole, uh, ma mass of dark matter versus black hole mass, so account for all the dark matter. And uh, when you look, put on, on it the Lehman alpha constraint, assuming that dark matter accounts for all the dark matter, you can exclude the region in green here. Notice that I cannot actually directly constrain uh, the case of dark matter being a fraction uh, of all the dark matter, dark matter arising from primordial ev evaporation as a fraction of the dark matter, uh, because in that case, my transfer function is not going to be exactly the same. It's not going just to be a simple cut, but it's going to be a cut plus a plateau, which cannot be just as simply be constrained by the same uh, data. So at the end of the day, um, I see that my Lehman alpha bound is, allows me to, to kill a bunch of scenario for a certain value of the minimal, I mean, the fraction, the initial fraction of prime model black hole and masses that can go from 2 MeV actually up to a very uh, much larger masses. So here I arrive to my conclusion. So I see I have uh, uh, tried to convey you the, the idea that uh, generally you can actually uh, constrain a bunch of a dark matter scenario thanks to uh, cosmology and in particular thanks to uh, uh, their properties of non cold dark matter cutting the power spectrum on small scales. Uh, for fins from Frisin, uh, it, it seems to, uh, to cut the possibility to test fins, I mean, certain scenario of fins in a collider due to a long leaf particle uh, that would appear in colliders due to the small coupling. Uh, now, uh, looking at modified early cosmology, you can actually reopen the parameter space and still be able to test uh, your favorite FIMP model uh, in, uh, in colliders. Um, for uh, not even uh, feebly pa massive particles from primordial black hole evaporation, you have no other interaction than gravitation and, than gravitation, and still cosmology allow you to uh, test uh, your dark matter scenario. So, that's it. I'm done. I would like to thank you for listening. And I also would like to, uh, to, to just add up that uh, at ULB, we are currently hiring. Postdoc positions are open. So if you can spread around, uh, that's fantastic. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Laura. Uh, Laura, so let's uh, have, have time for questions. I can start asking a question. Uh, do you have to change the basic inflationary model in order to generate is uh, primordial black holes? So I'm not uh, touching upon the, the generation of primordial black holes. I'm just assuming that I, I have generated these black holes uh, in the mono, for monochromatic distribution, and I'm just assuming that they are there. Some other people uh, well before me have been uh, looking at these possibilities, and I have to admit I didn't dig into it. OK, thank you, Laura. Uh, Andre? Hi, Laura. Thanks for the nice talk. Uh, well, I have one question about the FIMP scenario yes. at low LOT reheat. Uh, did you check if it, it has any impact on the transfer, transfer function? Yes, so, so yeah. you mean in the matter dominated era? For, yes. no, I'm, yeah, I'm, no, I'm, yeah, I'm thinking about the really low T reheat case. Yeah. yeah, yeah, if you have really low T, re, t, t the reheating temperature, you might, I mean, depending on your scenario, have been producing your dark matter into a, 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 a matter dominated era, okay, instead mm -hmm. of a radiation dominated era, which is indeed what I have assumed in order to extract uh, the, 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 the constraints from, uh, from, uh, from, from Lehman Alpha. And, uh, I didn't compute it in the matter dominated era. And as I know of, nobody did until now. OK. OK, thank you. Any more questions for Laura? OK, so if not, thank you very much, Laura, for your talk. And we'll move on. So the next um, speaker is uh, Hardy Vermay. I hope I pronounced uh, his name correctly. So Hardy, if you can uh, share your screen, please. Uh, yes. So. Uh, okay, yeah. you can see. Go ahead. Yep. Thank you very much. Go ahead. Okay. Thanks for the 
for the imitation and oh, I did a wrong thing. Okay, so I'm uh, uh, again uh, talking about parameter black holes and uh, and possibilities to detect them or limit them uh, with uh, gravitational wave uh, observations. So let's get uh, uh, to the talk. Uh, so this plot uh, or similar plots have all <coughs> have um, already been shown. So uh, primordial black holes span uh, uh, the heaviest mass range for uh, dark matter. And uh, in order to be dark matter, they have to be heavier than 10 to the 19 solar masses, 10 to the minus 19 solar masses before they would uh, evaporate before the Hubble time, the constraints are a bit uh, larger uh, due to the uh, uh, gamma ray background that the evaporating black holes uh, produce. So, but there is a small window where the constraints have large un uncertainties. Uh, so, uh, 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 allowing for all dark matter to be in primordial black holes. Then, uh, from 10 to the minus 11 to roughly one solar mass or a bit above, uh, the abundance is mostly constrained by microlensing. And uh, in the 100 solar mass range, there is LIGO uh, that doesn't see uh, the stochastic gravitational background and that doesn't see enough uh, primordial black hole mergers that it should if uh, it would uh, make up a large proportion of dark matter. And if you go even uh, to heavier masses, then you would see uh, too much uh, accretion that would uh, change the CMB. So, uh, as I said, there are a few uh, windows uh, for uh, primordial black holes as uh, dark matter. Then, uh, so uh, as, as a, uh, one possible motivation for, for looking at primordial black holes. But uh, there are also other uh, unsolved problems like uh, supermassive black holes. Um, when, uh, when stars collapse, then the then the black holes are too light to accrete efficiently and produce this uh, supermassive black hole. So uh, easy solution is to have a, have a, a bunch of uh, intermediate mass uh, uh, black holes uh, lying around, for example, promoter black holes, and then they can accrete uh, sufficiently fast and become uh, supermassive black holes. And, uh, of course, we have seen uh, several black hole mergers by uh, LIGO, Virgo, and uh, the origin of these mergers is so far unknown, so we can uh, also uh, look at the scenario where uh, these uh, black holes are primordial. And this is uh, uh, the second half of the talk, I will mainly focus on this, this possibility. So let's take a very quick look at primordial black hole formation so the most typical models are uh, uh, models of inflation with a flat uh, potential or, or a small bump. So the field rolls down, it stops on the bump, and if it spins enough uh, e folds on that bump, it, uh, it can uh, generate a peak in the primordial curvature power spectrum. Now, the, the issue there is that uh, the first phase that generates the fluctuations for CMB uh, still works as a uh, as usual uh, slow rolling inflation. And if you split the inflation into 20 e folds for, uh, for uh, primordial black holes and let's say 40 e folds for CMB, then you need a model uh, that produces uh, the correct CMB spectrum for uh, within 40 e folds. So, uh, that means the heavier the black holes, the shorter the first phase has to be. Uh, which means that in typical models, you get a small NS. Uh, if you want to produce black holes in the window, uh, where you could have um, all primordial black holes as dark matter, so very light uh, primordial black holes, then it's, it's uh, many models are known. But uh, for, for, uh, for solar mass black holes, the model building is a bit more uh, 
complicated. It's not possible, of course, but uh, there are, are, are some issues to get uh, nice looking models uh, if, if you care about these things. And, uh, and next, so if you have this peak in the, uh, in the power spectrum, then uh, it can collapse to uh, a black hole if it reaches, a, if it crosses a critical threshold. So the mass is roughly uh, comparable to the, uh, to the uh, horizon mass that is the mass that's contained in the horizon. So, and um, in, um, in here, I, I described the critical collapse model. So it happens when, when the fluctuations are nearly cir circular and large fluctuations tend to be. And of course, there are some uh, un uncertainties. Uh, for example, uh, the collapse, uh, the critical threshold depends on the shape of the fluctuation and physical shape. But uh, in, in general, the mass function that you expect is a power law with the heavy, with the exponential cutoff at, at heavy masses. And the average PBH mass is roughly the mass of the horizon. And, uh, and the second uh, feature, if you have this pump in the power spectrum, then you can produce uh, a stochastic uh, gravitational wave uh, signal. So the, uh, the scalar curvature perturbations act as a source for gravitational waves at the second order. And, um, and uh, uh, produce a gravitational wave background. And this uh, background can be observed by uh, future gravitational wave um, experiments. So LIGO uh, unfortunately uh, probes the region that's, that, that is already excluded by uh, uh, the constraints from black hole evap evaporation, but um, future experiments can probe uh, smaller frequencies and, uh, and start seeing the gap for uh, the very light black holes. So if, if you look at the plot, then the gray curve is, the, is, the, is roughly the uh, height of the peak needed to produce uh, uh, pramodal black, uh, all pramodal black hole dark matter. And uh, we can also see that uh, we cannot probe uh, evaporating black holes that uh, evaporate uh, within uh, one second. And uh, in the solar mass range, we see uh, uh, we have uh, pulsar timing array experiments. And uh, there is a potential signal from, uh, from, uh, from nanograph. They haven't uh, detected uh, uh, monopolar or dipolar correlations, or th there are no. Uh, but uh, there, there is also no, uh, no uh, quadrupolar uh, correlations, which would be a, a sign of gravitational waves. So it's not clear at all if, it's, it, if it is a gravitational wave signal, but uh, we, could, we can see uh, how it plays with um, models of promodal black holes. And uh, of, of course, the astrophysical explanation for this uh, is uh, in spirals of supermassive black holes that you would also expect. And, uh, and the slope uh, required is shown on the right panel. And uh, we can see that the model is roughly in agreement. And uh, here, the, the frequency uh, that uh, one of can observe is roughly three solar masses would correspond to roughly three solar mass primordial black holes. And so we have uh, a few, few points. We have the slope, we have the amplitude of the signal, and we have the uh, mass range. And uh, if we compare this, if we build a model, uh, uh, we assume different peaks in the curvature power spectrum, uh, uh, power law and um, and a broken power law and uh, a low normal peak. And in both cases, we see that uh, the signal is a bit too weak to explain, for example, the, the, the pro pro progenitors for uh, uh, the LIGO Virgo mergers. Uh, so the abundance needed is roughly 10 to the minus three and the best uh, fit abundance is, uh, is below 10 to the minus 12. But of course, there are large uh, uncertainties and uh, increasing the, uh, 
or changing the abundance prediction can uh, change uh, easily by a few orders of magnitude because it's exponentially sensitive to the uh, peak of the power spectrum. But uh, the, if there is the second scenario that is potentially interesting for primordial black holes, and this was the scenario for uh, primordial seeds of supermassive black holes. And since the peak, uh, the, the, the mass range for uh, nanograv is around the one, uh, one uh, solar mass, uh, the seeds for supermassive black holes should be much heavier. So it's possible to, to have the peak actually higher than the, than the best fit uh, uh, nanograv height. And so it's possible to explain uh, supermassive black holes with this. And uh, there are, have been a few other studies that, uh, so uh, for example, if, if, if you change the uh, equation of state of uh, uh, at the time when the promoted black holes fo are formed, then you can, uh, of course, change the predictions a bit. And if you have a very flat power spectrum, then you could have uh, promoted black holes in the low mass uh, window uh, as all dark matter uh, while explaining the, the nanograph signal. So, but uh, this is uh, it from the, from the first uh, part. And uh, now there is a recent <coughs> uh, LIGO and Virgo uh, released uh, the first half of the, uh, of the third observing run uh, recently. So they found uh, 39 new events. Uh, now they see uh, one event uh, uh, every week, even more than one event. So they, 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 uh, they observe for 26 we uh, weeks. So uh, we, sh we, should, we should see uh, many, many more uh, events in the near, near future. And of course, now it's possible to start looking at uh, properties of, of the black hole population. So do they fit uh, astrophysical black holes or do they fit promodal black holes better? And uh, this can provide hints for, for um, the origin of, of these events. So let's, uh, let's look at some uh, distinguishing features of, uh, of these uh, different uh, sources for these uh, events. So first of all, uh, we have the mass distribution. And as discussed above, the typical uh, promoted black hole mass uh, distributions are some peaks that have a width, that have a, a mean value. The shape can uh, change, a bit, uh, change a bit depending on the model. The astrophysics is, of course, much more complicated. It's not possible, though. We don't have a clear model uh, for this. Uh, but in, in general, we expect that uh, there is a cut at low masses because uh, uh, you would collapse into neutron stars, and uh, for heavier masses, there is this uh, pair instability supernova gap where the star just uh, uh, explodes and doesn't leave any, uh, any black hole behind. Uh, and uh, okay, so let's, uh, uh, let's look at the second uh, discriminator, uh, the redshift dependence. So, of course, the primordial black holes can start forming binaries. Um, uh, even before uh, matter, uh, matter radiation equality. And uh, it can be shown that uh, the, if we go uh, backwards in time, then uh, we expect that the merger rate grows with the redshift. For astrophysical black holes, the situation is different. It's, it's expected to grow, uh, but uh, uh, since uh, if we go far back, uh, back far enough, then there are no stars and you cannot have any astrophysical black holes. So it starts to decrease around set three. Uh, this is not, uh, since we don't have enough, uh, enough statistics, enough en events, then, uh, and we see up to set one, then currently this uh, uh, is not a good way to distinguish, distinguish between the different populations, but uh, as we, have better detectors, we, we should uh, uh, start to uh, see differences soon. Then uh, uh, there are black hole spins. So uh, 
promoted black holes are assumed to be formed uh, uh, non-spinning and they can accumulate spins by accretion. But there was a very nice uh, paper on, uh, on, on studying this uh, in, in the context of the, of the new uh, data by Wong et al. Um, and they find that uh, if you include the spins, then uh, models of accretion, uh, models with more accretion uh, are, are favored. But uh, on the other hand, the accretion of promoted black holes, uh, especially into binary uh, black holes, is not well known. So we don't uh, include this uh, in our study. And uh, if you look at astrophysical black holes, then uh, the stars uh, mostly forming pairs. And so you have pairs of black holes when the stars collapse. And uh, this formation mechanism produces uh, black holes where spins are, are aligned. And currently this is disfavored. But of course there are different population channels. So also uh, this needs to be better understood. There is no definite conclusions based on the, on the current data, but, um, but the situation is very interesting. And finally, we could also look at spatial correlations. So uh, promoted black holes are expected to follow the distribution of dark matter, uh, while uh, astrophysical black holes are expected to follow the distribution of baryons. So, and uh, we look at uh, these two uh, observables. So a very uh, quick overview of uh, promoted black hole binary formation. So uh, there are different channels. The black binaries can be formed in uh, halos, um, for example, but the dominant channel, so the, the binaries that dominate the, the merger rate are formed in the early universe. And uh, in the beginning, you form uh, the density collapse, you form a, a promoter black holes that are coupled to the expansion. They just follow the Hubble flow. They, there are no peculiar velocities and the density drops and they start to couple uh, to, to each other. So the first, uh, Pramod black hole picks its closest neighbor and couples to it. So in principle, all since every black hole has a close neighbor, then all of them should form binaries uh, initially. But uh, <coughs> uh, of, of course, many of these binaries are uh, are disrupted. So uh, what happens? They got the couple from expansion. There is a force. Then uh, there is, uh, of course, there are uh, other black holes around. Uh, there are also matter fluctuations that cause tidal forces. Uh, especially tidal torque that uh, that uh, that results in uh, in the angular momentum of, of the binary binary, but the ex eccentricities of the binaries are typically very uh, large, uh, so the uh, angular momenta are small acquired in, in this way, and of course at the end uh, if uh, so the binary uh, the the distance in the initial pair has to be very small, much smaller than the average distance typically. So they they couple from expansion much earlier, but uh, uh, but quite soon they will also start to see the other black holes around them. And uh, there are two uh, uh, important sources that should be distinguished. Uh, so you can have a third black hole close enough to the binary that falls into the binary and destroys it. So we don't see the merger. Uh, but it can also be absorbed into a small cluster uh, and uh, the clusters are very dense uh, in the early universe around, let's say, uh, uh, recombination. So they are quite effective at the destroying binaries. So we have to look at the binaries that are really isolated and don't uh, end up in a cluster early. So the merger rate, uh, predicting from this uh, channel uh, is quite large. If we just look at the binaries that are formed in the early universe, so if we compare this to the ob observed rate, which is about 10 um, events per cubic gigaparsec uh, per year, then this is much higher. It has a universal time uh, dependence, uh, which can be um, tested. If we can see uh, uh, the merger rate at higher uh, redshifts, and uh, of course, as I said, most of the binaries are actually disrupted. So if all black holes would be dark matter, 
of promote the black holes for all uh, dark matter, then uh, roughly 0.1% uh, of the binaries uh, should survive. So of course, this depends on the mass distribution and so on, but, but this is a rough estimate. And uh, as I already said, that the binaries are very hard. That means that uh, if they collide with the different uh, promoter black hole, then uh, you still have a binary, but the binary is much less eccentric. Uh, and if the ex eccentricity decreases, then the coalescence time uh, can increase by uh, 10 orders of magnitude. So you will never see the merger of this black hole. But uh, there are some very tight binaries that are also uh, eccentric, but uh, since they are uh, very close to each other, then they could uh, uh, merge within the Hubble time and contribute to the uh, merger rate. So this is the prediction for a merger rate for a log normal mass function and uh, centered around the 20 solar masses. And we see the effects of the different suppression factors. So the uh, blue line is without any suppression. The green line is if we uh, exclude the binaries that have a very close uh, third promoter black hole. And uh, the final uh, suppression factor is uh, suppression by clusters. So we, uh, we assume that, the, uh, that all the clusters that are smaller than, than some size, uh, so uh, uh, given by, for example, the, uh, the collision uh, time or the uh, core collapse time, so the small, small clusters of promoter black holes uh, as, uh, let's say, global clusters will uh, be unstable within the Hubble time. And therefore, the, the core can collapse. Uh, let's say if it's a cluster of promoter black hole, if the promoter black hole pair ends up in the center, which it can because of mass segregation, then it's very easy to disrupt the binary in this cluster. And Ardi, finally, Ardi, you have uh, around five minutes, okay? Ah, okay. So I will uh, hurry up. So, uh, and uh, this is the this is the result of um, of our fit. So we uh, look at three uh, different scenarios. Uh, one scenario is where we only have astrophysical background and the astrophysical background is the most uh, naive one. We have a power law a mass function that truncated at, uh, at, uh, at the ends. Uh, then we have a PBH only scenario where we look at the low normal mass function or the critical mass function. And then we can add these two sources and, uh, and see uh, uh, what the uh, uh, maximum, maximum likelihood fit selects. And we find that the promoter black hole fit uh, mass function fits the data quite bad. So it, it mostly selects uh, the data where you have a bump that contains roughly half events and the bump that, uh, and then a cluster physical background. So the gray band in this plot is the, is the histogram of the observed events and the error bars just represent the error bars in the, in the masses. Um, and uh, so this is the uh, this is the parameter range, uh, well, the uh, parameters for promoter black holes for these uh, mass functions, and we can see that, uh, uh, for example, in the middle panel, the the y-axis is the fraction of uh, black holes in dark matter, the log logarithm of it. And uh, we can see that in the combined fit, it's, uh, it's much smaller and it also prefers uh, heavier masses. So that uh, in the combined fit, uh, it really uh, fits the bump that we see in the data. And uh, so this is, a, this is a plot of, uh, of the merger rate of astrophysical uh, black holes uh, compared to the, the fraction of promoter black holes. And again, we see that uh, so the, the dashed lines show the ratio of promoter black, ex expected number of promoter black holes events over the expected number of astrophysical black events, uh, black hole uh, events. And we see that uh, the ratio is roughly one in the in the best fit region. Uh, now, the, the scenario where we don't have any uh, uh, astrophysical black holes or the uh, astrophysical black hole uh, uh, background is uh, vanishes is disfavored at, at four sigma so it's 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 quite disfavored while if you only have the astrophysical background then uh, the a peak uh, on 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 top of it is is favored by less than two sigma and of course since we have selected 
the most naive model for the astrophysics. It doesn't mean that uh, that we have discovered uh, primordial black holes. It just means that uh, 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 we might uh, have to uh, use a more accurate model or a different model for astrophysical background. So we see a peak in the data and there can be, a, uh, the peak can be primordial or uh, astrophysical. We, uh, we don't know that, but in the model we have chosen, we can only say uh, things about, uh, so the peak uh, can only be uh, uh, primordial. And, uh, and uh, but what we can tell is, uh, let's go to the, okay. Uh, what, what we can tell is that the, that um, uh, astrophysical only scenario uh, is uh, disfavored, uh, even if you look, uh, so, but, uh, sorry, uh, the primordial black hole only scenario is disfavored, uh, even if we include the most naive astrophysical scenario. And finally, um, uh, we can derive constraints from the, from the outdoor run. Uh, here uh, I show the uh, monochromatic uh, constraints for the monochromatic mass function and, uh, and the low normal uh, mass function with the given width. The best fit scenario is shown, this, shown by this uh, small blue uh, dot there, but uh, it's also possible that only a subpopulation of these uh, black holes, of, of these mergers are primordial. So if we pick uh, uh, random uh, sets, from this, uh, uh, from the events, and say that they are uh, that, that, that they are primordial, then we can rule out, uh, we can weaken the constraints a bit, and this is the region between the red dashed line and the solid red line. So, uh, and uh, this is it from me. So, again, the PBH only scenario seems to be disfavored. There are uh, strong constraints, so black holes, uh, primordial black holes, can be can make less than. Uh, uh, 0.2 percent uh, of dark matter in uh, in the Liga Virgo range. Of course, a better understanding of accretion and spins uh, must uh, uh, is uh, is needed. So this could change the the the, the results of our uh, analysis and uh, uh, also uh, Nonorov has seen a signal which might may hint uh, for primordial black hole formation. And uh, finally. Uh, a positive message is uh, that black hole, primordial black holes are still a viable uh, dark matter candidate uh, in the in the light mass range. So thank you. Thank you very much, Hardy, for the talk. Um, maybe we have time for one or two questions. Um, any questions for Hardy? I don't see any questions. So, uh, so thank you very much, Hardy. Uh, we have more questions during the discussion. So okay, maybe we you. can uh, move forward with uh, our own Nicolas Bernal. So um, you can start stop sharing, Hardy. And uh, Nicolas, can you share your yes, screen, please? Can can you guys hear me? I can. We can hear you, and we okay, can see okay. your slides. So please go ahead. Okay, thanks. So let me start the. Okay, so thank you very much, Rogerio. So I will present this work done in collaboration with Oscar Zapata from the Universidad de Antioquia in Medellin. Uh, it's about dark matter and, and primordial black holes from Nicolas Bernal from the Universidad de Antonio Nariño in Bogota, Colombia. Okay, so how seen a lot about uh, dark matter and primordial black holes, especially today. So just to emphasize one point that's okay, we, I think we're kind of super convinced about the existence of this dark matter because we have several observations at very different scales and that's an important point. And what we want to emphasize that dark matter is presenting us like a, like a missing gravitational force, right? So all that we know uh, about dark matter comes via this um, uh, the dark gravitational force, if you want a very different scale. So, how is dark matter produced? We don't know. We hope it's a wind because we, we all love winds. Basically, because winds are super easy, well, in principle, are easy to, <laughs> to, to detect and in very different channels and with different um, uh, mediators. However, uh, this wind uh, paradigm is kind of under, under tension. 
Another possibility, however, is that dark matter never reaches the chemical equilibrium typical of, of wind. But if, if it has a much smaller interaction rate, it could be uh, a wind. And, and we have seen a lot of winds today. So Nico said that the winds are produced pasito a pasito, sobe sobecito. But um, another possibility is that dark matter interacts uh, with, a, as Laura says, not, not even a, a fin, right? So interaction rate could be even much smaller. And we can also imagine the scenario where, um, where, where there's basically no, no connection between the two sectors, between the visible and the hidden, and the hidden sector. So in, in, the, in the sense of the particle physics um, uh, portal, so no, no, no Higgs portal, no neutrino portal, no kinetic mixing. So in that case, how star matter could have been produced? So first, that's like a nightmare scenario. So in the case where dark matter only couples uh, to the standard model via gravitational interactions. So it's not that I like this, this possibility. However, we have seen that in that case, dark matter is unavoidable produced via pr uh, primordial black hole Hawking evaporation, right? It can be irradiated when when primordial black hole fucking evaporate. So let's examine that um, uh, possibility. So we have seen a lot about PVH the, this morning. So you know, basically that they are produced a large density fluctuation that can collapse into black holes in the, in the early universe. So once produced, once created, they will start losing mass just by emitting all particles via Hawking evaporation. And when I say all, I mean uh, standard model particle, but all, also all the other BSM particles. So this uh, primordial black, black hole will have basically a black body spectrum, of course, up to gray factor. And they will have, the spectrum will be characterized by the temperature, which is basically the inverse of their mass. So they will start, um, once created, they will start evaporating, so their mass will be reduced. And therefore, its temperature will start to increase, right? So in that sense, uh, PDH will unavoidable radiate dark matter on the penalty on, on, on its mass, right? And also Laura said before that if their mass, the initial mass is smaller than 10 to the nine or so grams, they will completely evaporate before BBN and therefore they are very poorly constrained, okay? So how are um, PDH produced? I mean, that's kind of, of complicated here we have a we follow an approach which is kind of model independent so in the sense that um we will take like um okay assume that a single pba will be characterized by this mass at formation that we'll call m initial so m initial or equivalently that corresponds to the standard model temperature at the, at the moment of formation which will be will, uh, will denote by t initial so M initial is the initial uh, PBH mass, and T, T initial is the standard model temperature at the moment of, of, of formation. So this quantity will uh, completely, of course, if there, there are no uh, uh, spin, I will assume that they're, they're not spinning. So all the uh, dynamics of a single primordial black hole, black hole will be characterized by this single parameter in the initial mass. But of course, we don't want to have a single primordial black hole in the, in the universe. We'll have a, a collection. And that number of primordial black holes is characterized by this parameter beta. And beta is basically the ratio of primordial black hole energy density over the standard mode energy density at the moment of formation. So all the PBH dynamics will be parameterized by these two parameters, the initial mass and the energy density at, at, at formation. So these are parameters beta and M initial. Okay, now if you want to compute what the dark matter uh, um, density emitted by primordial black holes, so the idea is very simple. So it's simply the product of the primordial black hole energy density, density, sorry, times the number of dark matter particles emitted per primordial black hole. It's simple, it's, it's just as simple as this one, right? And the number of, like, of dark matter particles radiated per primordial black hole will only depend on the mass, the right of the mass of the black hole and the masses of the dark matter. So because it's, it's just a, a, a black body spectrum, so we can, can compute 
how many particles are, are, are emitted. And it basically will depend on the, on the spin and uh, on the masses. So for light dark matter, meaning much lighter than the initial black hole uh, temperature will be uh, given by the, this ratio, so in the mass over the plant mass square. And if dark matter is, is heavy, in the sense that heavier than the initial black hole temperature, it will be given by, will be proportional to the plant mass over the, the dark matter mass square. Just to emphasize that, uh, that there are no free couplings here because it's all, uh, all, all GR, right? So the plant mass is the only scale into, into the game. So the last point that I want to emphasize here is that as primordial black holes will stay like, like dust, so like non-relativistic matter, they can eventually dominate the total energy density of the universe. And they will naturally give rise to a non-standard expansion era in the, in the early universe. Okay, so I told you that we have this basically two free parameters. So the initial temperature, the standard model temperature at, at which uh, the, the black holes are, are created, we assume a monochromatic black holes, which corresponds to an initial mass, right? And beta, which characterizes the, the, the amount of, of primordial black holes at formation. So we have seen Laura already talk uh, about this constraint of CMB. I, we want to avoid this CMB constraint here, which is basically the scale of inflation. So we, we don't want they, them to be created at super high temperature. And we also want the primordial black holes to completely evaporate before BBN. So we want them, this initial temperature to be between 10 to a 12, 10 to a 16 GV, which correspond to a black hole masses in the, G, in the gram ballpark. So say between 0.1 gram and 10 to the eight, which correspond to a, like 100 tons, right? So, uh, and also there, the, this, this uh, band here we want to avoid, uh, which we call GW, so gravitational waves, because they uh, give rise to a bad, uh, to bad, reaction, bad reaction. So basically that uh, the energy density stored in gravitational wave is much is higher than the one of the background, so uh, of, of radiation. And this dotted line corresponds to the border between the radiation domination be below the, in this part here. So in this part below the dotted line, uh, radiation is always dominating the, the expansion rate. However, in this part above the dotted line, the primordial black hole will eventually start dominating the energy density. Okay. So if you want to produce dark matter particles, uh, so these four lines correspond to the parameter space that give rise to the observed relic, uh, relic abundance of dark matter for different dark matter masses. This one here, the dotted line corresponds to one MeV dark matter. Uh, this one here, so the dot dash corresponds to one TV. The dash here corresponds to 10 to the nine GV and the solid line corresponds to 10 to the 15 GV. So super heavy dark matter. So as you can see here, we can base Primordial black holes can basically radiate all the uh, dark matter with any, any masses from super light, so well, super light, say any sub GV at least, uh, scale dark matter, to dark matter as heavy as uh, basically the, the, the Planck mass. However, there are further constraints, for instance, the ones uh, uh, presented by, by, by Laura, in particular, because so this is the warm dark matter, right? So if dark matter is uh, actually, dark matter is radiated relativistically from um, PBH, so we can have trouble with structural formation. And actually, if you if you are in this chunk of the parameter space, which and and actually, if dark matter is lighter than say 30 GV or so, this part of the parameter space will be ruled out because of Feynman alpha and, and, and structural formation. But anyway, my point is that here you can see that we can basically radiate. Uh, dark matter particle with uh, any, 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 any mass. Okay, now two points. Okay, so here we're assuming basically that dark matter is not even a thing, so that uh, the, um, they have a very suppressed um, interaction with the standard model. However, we have to say anything about possible dark matter self interaction. So now we'll, we'll see what happens if dark matter features sizable self interaction. Okay, so in that case, what I'm having in mind is that uh, with that much be sizable self interaction, meaning that you can have, for instance, if in the case of, of uh, scalar dark matter, but just an example, 
So you can have quartic interactions. So you can have sizable or efficient elastic scattering. And that means that dark matter could thermalize, right? So the dark matter distribution could be characterized by a, by a temperature, by a dark temperature, if, if, if you want. But that's not the only possibility. So if, 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 uh, um, in certain interactions are even so very, very efficient. We can also have number changing interactions like two to three, two to four, or, yeah, or, or even higher in interactions. So for instance, again, the case of scalar dark matter, when you have a, a quartic couplings, you can have these four to two uh, interactions where you're converting four dark matter particles into two, into two dark matter particles, right? Or here you can see that we are having like these uh, quartic uh, like couplings. So what the effect of the, on the dark matter abundance is you have this sizable self interaction. So remember that before for computing the final dark matter yield, the question was how many, what was the PBH uh, um, density? And that number has, has to be multiplied by the number of dark matter particles produced per each uh, um, primordial black hole. However, if these number changing interactions are efficient, the number density uh, of these particles is not constant because after all, number changing interactions change the number density of dark matter particles. So now the question that we have to answer is what's the first, what's the energy density transfer from PBH to dark matter? Then what's the dark matter temperature? If of course, if dark matter reaches kinetic equilibrium and then what's the dark matter equilibrium number density? If uh, dark matter reaches chemical equilibrium via this, uh, two to three or two to four uh, interaction. Okay, so just emphasizing what I said before. So self-interaction will have two main effects. First, they will tend to increase the dark matter number density. After all, these kind of interactions are, are, are increasing the, the, the number of dark matter particles from two to three or two to four, right? But of course the price to pay is that we are trading uh, kinetic energy to, to mass. So we are decreasing the mean dark matter kinetic energy. So this type of interaction, what, what they are doing is that if you want, they are changing two very uh, an energetic uh, dark matter particles into three or into four uh, less uh, rapid uh, uh, dark matter particles. So we are increasing the dark matter density and the price to pay that we are decreasing the mean dark matter kinetic energy. And these two things are kind of interesting for, for the phenomenology. Okay, so here I'm showing you again the same uh, parameter space. So beta as a function of T initial for four different masses. So 10 keV, 10 MeV, 10 GV, and 10 TeV. So the dot, dotted line corresponds to the case that I showed you before. So the case without self-interaction. And now the, uh, the, uh, the solid line corresponds to the case with self-interaction. So you can see the two different things. So first that this interaction makes the production more effective because here we can explore smaller beta. So for instance, we're going from here to here, right? So smaller values of beta could be explored now because um, we have certain interactions. So the production mechanism is much more efficient. And also self interactions are cooling down dark matter. So now in particular, this KEV range is uh, is viable. Before, as Laura said before, so typical K, uh, uh, dark matter in the KV uh, ballpark is not uh, allowed because we are in tension with structure formation with Ly Lyman alpha, for instance. However, now that dark matter is, 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 is colder than before, so we are able to explore um, dark matter in the KV ballpark because of the, of the of self interaction. And one other thing I want to emphasize is that this was a percentage is kind of more independent in the sense that if you take any model uh, with featuring three to two, four to two, whatever, scalar dark matter or, or, or vector or whatever, um, you will have different lines for instance, of course, but all these lines will be in this uh, sh uh, gray shaded area, right? So, so this line corresponds if you want to the maximum amount of self-interactions and the, the maximum uh, effect that self-interaction can have. 
So this kind of model independent, right? So whatever model you take, you will always be inside this uh, gray uh, dash uh, area. Okay, the, so that was um, uh, one point, self-interactions. Uh, self now I want to raise another, another point which corresponds to the gravitational UV freezing. Okay, so this kind of different subject. So, okay, here I'm showing you in the, in the, in the left is exactly the same plot that I showed you before, right? Beta and the, the initial temperature of the standard model or, or, or the initial mass of the, of the black hole. And here in the right panel, I'm just showing you the exactly the same information, just in another, presented in a different way. So in the X axis, I'm showing the dark matter mass in GB. And the Y axis is the P in, so the standard model temperature at the moment of formation for the primordial black hole. Or, or the initial uh, PBH uh, mass in grams. So it's exactly the same information with exactly the same color. For instance, I, I want to avoid this region because uh, uh, it's in conflict with uh, the scale of inflation. I want to avoid this because uh, I want uh, PBH to evaporate, completely evaporate before BPN. Uh, this region is in tension with the warm dark matter, so I don't want dark matter to be uh, very, 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 very light. And in this region, I have always a dark matter under abundance. And here, this big chunk of the parameters page, which is white, corresponds to the region where I can, I know how to produce dark matter uh, from PBH evaporation without self-interaction. I, I forget here about self-interaction. So you can see we, can, we know that PBH can uh, radiate dark matter uh, as light as say MEV up to basically the, the Planck scale, right? So all these in all these regions, white region, I know how to regenerate the dark matter abundance. And just want to emphasize that these typically correspond to heavy dark matter. Well, not always, but I mean, we can have super heavy dark matter as heavy as they don't tend to 10, 14, 18 GVs. And this corresponds also to a formation when the, the of, of PBH when the universe was super, super hot. So ha very high temperatures of the, of the standard model plasma. That's a 16, 15, 14, whatever. Okay. So, I mean, that region of the parameter space, so corresponds to heavy dark, super heavy dark matter and high temperatures for the, for the standard model. Another gravitational production mechanism is, is, is there and is very efficient and corresponds to the gravitational UV freezing. So gravitational UV freezing is just an example of, of, of freezing. So actually of UV freezing, where the mediator is the, is the, stand, the massless standard model graviton. So the, the, the normal standard gravita, uh, graviton here, there's no new physics uh, uh, what, whatsoever. So uh, because after all the standard model can produce, we can produce dark matter particles out of uh, standard model collision via these two to two annihilation mediated by an F, the external exchange of a, of a standard model graviton. Do you know that standard model graviton is a, a, spin, to, a spin to guy that couples uh, through the energy momentum tensor, right? So here there's no, no free parameter. The only coupling if you want is the, is the Planck mass. And this process will de depend only on the dark matter mass and, and, and spin, of course, and the reheating temperature. Yes, T heat, the, the, the onset of the radiation domination era, but there are no free couplings whatsoever because the only coupling is, is, is the plant mass. And it's basically, it's not free, right? So we can compute the, what's the dark matter abundance in the case of the gravitational freezing and will depend on the dark matter mass and on the reheating temperature and basta, that's it. So here I'm showing you a plot of the reheating temperature and the mass. So the region temperature on the y axis and the dark matter mass on the x axis. So I want to avoid again this, this region because of the scale of inflation. And here the border of this triangle here corresponds to the parameter space where the dark matter, the, the, the whole abundance of the dark matter is produced via the, the UV freezing. So this, uh, this border here. here. And inside the triangle, okay. And inside this triangle, there's an overabundance. So I want to avoid this uh, uh, 
uh, chunks this, the inside of this triangle because uh, I'm overproducing um, uh, dark matter abundance via the UV prism. Okay. Now, okay, and let me emphasize that this again corresponds to super heavy dark matter. Well, super heavy, heavier at least that PV, right? But uh, this super efficient like when dark matter is 10, 10 to 13 GB or so. And very high reheating temperatures, 10 to the 14, 10 to the 15, 10 to the 13 GB or so. So my point is that both the um, Hawking evaporation and gravitational UV freezing are very efficient in the very same chunk of the parameter space, meaning super heavy dark matter and high uh, temperature from the standard model. So here I'm just showing you uh, basically the two mechanisms together. So two gravitational, purely gravitational dark matter production mechanism. So PBH and UV, UV freezing. So here is exactly the same parameter space I showed you before. So the initial, the temperature of, of, uh, of the standard model at formation of the PBH, and here is the dark matter mass, and this corresponds to the, basically the same constraint that I showed you before. The only the new one corresponds to the UV freezing in dark gray. For for the case where T reheat is exactly the same as the as the formation temperature formation of, of primordial black holes, when T reheat is 10 to the 16 GVs, and when T reheat is equal to 10 to the 14 GVs, right? So three choices for T reheat. So of course. The, the P initial and T reheat are not, in general, are not related. However, T initial has to be more than T reheat because we want the primor primordial black holes to be uh, formed um, when the universe is dominated by standard model radiation, right? So you can see that there's a, a strong interplay between these two formations and that, um, 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 in particular, the U freezing sets strong constraints on the on the production of uh, dark matter via Hawking operation of PBH. So that's uh, what we go here. So gravitational U freezing strongly constrained super heavy dark matter radiated by primordial black holes. And uh, so, N Nicolas, you have uh, around five minutes, okay? Okay, so I have five minutes for my conclusion. Ah. Thank you very much. <laughs> it will be very slow. Um, so it's possible that dark matter only features gravitational interactions, and I put this friend here. Um, so we have seen like, yes, primordial black holes can be formed in the early universe, like this collapse of uh, large uh, homogeneities. So if they lie in the, if the initial mass is in the range of, of grams, so between 10 to the minus one and 10 to the nine grams, they will evaporate before, before BBN. And that primordial black holes will hockey radiate the whole dark matter abundance. Right? If there are not self interactions, they, the, the, they can radiate mass, dark matter masses in the, uh, in, in the range of, say, MEVs to, to super heavy dark matter, 10 to 18, or something like that. However, this can change if dark matter features uh, sizable self interactions. And as I told you, the effect of self interaction will, will be basically two big effects. So they will boost the dark matter density by several orders of magnitude, and these boost factors can be computed in the model independent way, right? So the, 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 the dark matter emission will be more effective in the, mean, in the sense that we can now explore uh, smaller values of the beta, uh, beta parameter. And it's also interesting because, because it will cool down dark matter. So KV dark matter becomes viable again without being contradiction with the structure formation. And the last point that I want to raise is that uh, gravitational UV freezing is effective in the very same ballpark. So in the ballpark of, of heavy dark matter and heavy uh, and high dark, uh, temperature for the standard model. So high reheating temperature, that's what it was here. And then the interplay between these two gravitational production mechanisms has strong bounds in, on the upper, um, on, on, super heavy, on super heavy dark matter. And just to emphasize that these gravitational dark matter productions are completely unavoidable because there are no, 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 no coppings to tune, right? And um, thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Nicolas. So let's see if there are any uh, questions. There is one on the chat by Arvind. Arvind, do you want me to uh, ask or, or would you like to ask yourself? I, I ask then. 
So uh, he's thanking you for the nice talk and asking what is the fraction of dark matter in the super heavy dark matter formed from evaporation of primordial black holes? Well, it could be the whole abundance, right? There's no, for instance, um, here in this plot, this line corresponds to 10 to the 15 GB. So this line here, the solid line. So in, if you're along this line, you're producing the whole abundance. So 100%. So, okay. okay. In, in, the, in these lines, you're, you're exactly the good abundance. On the left, you're, uh, it's too much. So you're overclosing the universe. And on the left, on the, oh, sorry, on the right, you know, it's an underabundance. But yeah, you can produce the whole, whole observed dark matter abundance. Okay. So Diego has a... Oh, sorry. Ah, hi, Stephen. I didn't want to overstep, but I just had a quick follow-up point. Uh, you can even be transplankian in this scenario, right? Yeah, yeah. If you believe that particles might exist that are heavier than the Planck scale, uh, you can go for it. Exactly. Yes, I was kind of um, <laughs> conservative. <laughs> yeah, but, but, that's what it is. but then I have a question about this because if they are transplankian, they can only be produced very early on in the universe, right? So they will be diluted by entropy production. Well, so no, it's this... the other way around. It's very late because black holes evaporate, its mass decrease, and then its temperature increase. So at that point, at the end, you can produce particles as heavy as you want. Ah, yeah, I was thinking of the gravitational UV scenario. So that's mm. this. Yes, that's true, yeah. Okay, so Diego has a question. Diego, please go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> yes, in fact, it's related with, with this. Uh, what happened with exotic relics, uh, for example, monopoles or something like that? I don't know. No, well, I have something to say. Is that here I'm assuming that black holes evaporate completely, but um, I think nobody knows huh? that their operation may stop at some point when the temperature is of the order of the uh, of the Planck mass. But um, sorry, I'm not an expert on quantum gravity. Yes. I, I, maybe Stefano will say something about that in, the, in, in his talk, I don't know. Okay, um, any, any more questions for Nicolas? Otherwise, Nicolas, you have to make Stefano a co-host and stop oh, yes. sharing your screen because uh, you're the host. <laughs> Okay, done. So thank you. Okay, so, so Stefano, you can share a screen. Oh, it started with Bach, good. <laughs> okay, so uh, yes, yeah, so please go ahead, uh, Stefano. Okay, you recognize this book, I would assume. Very good, so uh, well, good afternoon from sunny California. And uh, let me start by thanking the organizers for inviting me to talk today. Very kind of them. Um, so today I will actually prove one of the greatest authority in science, XKCD, wrong uh, by showing that black holes are in fact not ruled out uh, by all of these things. And so it is interesting to consider them uh, if they're primordial as dark matter candidates. Uh, I'll then talk about where it is interesting to look for them. And I'll talk about no seums, space cows, and pyramids. So let me start by saying that this plot is wrong. And I was giving this talk uh, a couple of weeks ago and Bernard Carr was in the audience and uh, he was not very happy. Uh, but seriously, this plot is also outdated uh, and it continues to be updated. Uh, but you know, when folks in my group started working on primordial black hole, there was this question, well, if reality does look like that, uh, can there be enough primordial black holes around to be the dark matter? In other words, given a set of constraints, that you believe is reasonable. What is the maximal fraction of dark matter in primordial black holes? And one would be tempted to sort of go where these constraints are weakest uh, and pick them out. Uh, well, the reality is that these constraints, the constraints that I was showing here, are for a specific mass function. Uh, and in particular, they are calculated for the same mass. 
that's what you obtain. But if you go, say, to a log normal mass function, you obtain completely different constraints and you actually get further from the magic line up here uh, where the dark matter is 100% of it, where the primordial black holes are 100% of the dark matter. Uh, this is what you get, for instance, if you uh, have a power law uh, mass function. So literally, the first question that we asked when we thought seriously, you know, after lag detections, that maybe we are looking at a dark matter candidate in the form of primordial black holes was what is the mathematical function that maximizes the mass fraction of primordial black holes compatibly with a set of given constraints. Um, so, you know, this looks like a variational problem, uh, but in fact, it's a lot more subtle than that because variational problems usually don't have a constraint on the sign of the unknown function. Well, here we want a mass function that is positive defined. So it's not a variation of constraints, but luckily enough for me, um, this guy, Ben Lehman, uh, an incredible, amazing uh, physics graduate student right now, uh, came to us with a master's in mathematics from Stanford and actually had the exact answer to that problem. Uh, what he realized was that that problem is exactly equivalent to uh, minimizing the normal of a vector over, the, over a convex hole. Uh, and so the mathematical answer to that question is that the optimal mass function is a linear combination with calculable weights and calculable places of n delta functions if you're given n independent constraints. Uh, in other words, if you are given this n independent constraints, you've got in this case four, you've got exactly four delta functions with these calculable weights with algorithms that are well known in mathematics from the problem of the uh, norm of a vector of a, of a convex hole. Um, it's great to have an extraordinarily smart, uh, you know, student uh, with you, but it's it's also great when you have a second smart student, in this case, Jackson Yent, who's now, uh, who was an undergrad student when he worked with this, uh, and who's now a graduate student at Dartmouth College, to numerically validate that answer. And that's what Jackson did um, uh, here uh, with a you know, simple algorithm that moved around and optimized numerically the, the uh, mass function for primordial black holes, maximizing total amount of mass in primordial black holes. Uh, and he beautifully confirmed uh, Ben's theoretical results. Uh, so again, depending on your choice of constraints, you get a different set of delta functions and you can go ahead and calculate what is the absolute maximum uh, that uh, you can have in the fraction of primordial black holes uh, as dark matter candidates. And so even back then when constraints uh, were a little bit optimistic, uh, we found that yes, in fact, uh, PBH could be 100% uh, of the dark matter. Now I've been in the business of looking for a signal from dark matter for you know a fairly long time, more than a decade. Uh, and you know, there's always this lingering question, are we looking at an astrophysical signal or are we looking at new physics? So what really drove my attention closer and closer to primordial black holes is that there is a Goldilocks signature uh, of black holes being primordial. And that is, if in a gravity wave event, you observe one of the merging partners to have a mass below the Chandrasekhar mass. In other words, to have a mass that tells you that that black hole cannot come from the collapse of stars. Uh, and in fact, LIGO realized the importance of this point, uh, has already been searching very actively uh, for this category of events. Uh, so given a mass function, one can actually go ahead and calculate uh, what the rate of Goldilocks events is, uh, where that rate means, uh, where here Goldilocks means that You've got a merging black hole that is massive enough to be seen by LIGO and to be loud enough that LIGO could see the event. Uh, and on the other hand, that is uh, light enough that is below the summer, the Chandrasekhar mass. Uh, and one can then calculate uh, what is the maximal and minimal Goldilocks event rate uh, given a certain mass function in light and detectable primordial black holes. So uh, that's exactly what we did uh, with the same cast of characters, Ben Lehman, uh, and 
especially in this case, you didn't have a smart uh, mathematics, uh, but uh, we had to do this numerically. Uh, and so here you've got uh, the answer to the question uh, of what is, what is the maximal and minimal uh, event rate when no constraints are applied. Uh, well, here uh, is the answer when all constraints are applied. And let me point out that oftentimes you've got a bunch of light guys uh, and a few heavier guys. Uh, and, and this is to get the maximum possible merger rate. Uh, the reason is that here we are looking at the ability of these primordial black holes to form binaries. Uh, and to do that, it's a great idea to have a lot of light primordial black holes uh, that uh, you know, are, are dense enough that you form uh, binary systems with your Goldilocks black holes in this region here. Uh, and then once you do have a binary, you capture a third body uh, and, and you have the event that you're looking for uh, right there. So again, in the plane of the fraction of light and detectable black holes versus FBBH, again, the fraction of primordial black holes is dark matter, you can calculate the maximum and the minimum uh, event rate. So here's shown the minimum, here's shown the maximum. And you see that at LIGO, it's, it's not that bad. Uh, you go from uh, one in 10 years to one a year uh, pretty quickly, as long as you have at least 0.1 to 0.01% of the dark matter in the form of these light and detectable uh, primordial black holes. So that's pretty good. So LIGO informs us about the mass of black holes, but it also tells us something about the spin of black holes. And uh, with Nico Fernandez, whom we heard uh, uh, earlier today, uh, and here is, is a picture of him. Uh, I think the first time he saw snow as he was moving from California uh, to Illinois. Uh, you know, we thought, well, what can we learn about the origin uh, and the nature of black holes uh, observed to merge in uh, LIGO gravitational wave events from their spin? So first of all, let me just quickly uh, remind you that what LIGO sort of measures or is sensitive to is the effective spin, which really is uh, a dimensionless spin parameter that is sort of a mass average um, quantity that reflects the projection of the black hole spin onto the orbital angular momentum of the merging pair. Uh, and so having an effective spin of one means that you have large uh, spins that are exactly aligned uh, with the orbital angular momentum. Spin of zero means either that the spins are anti-aligned or that the spins are themselves quite small. And uh, effective spin of negative one means that they're large and anti-aligned. So, what Nico did was uh, to look at the prior, at the expected distribution of effective spin parameters for a bunch of possibilities. This is what you expect from primordial black holes that form during radiation domination. Uh, and this is what LIGO sort of uh, uses to categorize the expected intrinsic spin uh, probability distribution of astrophysical black holes. So you've got a low, a flat and a high intrinsic spin distribution. Uh, and then once you decide whether spins are preferentially aligned or preferentially uh, you know, distributed isotropically, uh, you have all you need to calculate uh, the effective spin uh, prior that you expect in a given set of models. So in this case, primordial black holes is this blue line. Li means low intrinsic spin uh, and isotropically distributed uh, and so on. So we're going to use the low intrinsic uh, spins isotropic distribution as the benchmark distribution, which is what LIGO also usually adopts. Uh, and here are the posterior for the first 10 events. And Nico, as we speak, is running uh, the same algorithm and the same search uh, for uh, the much larger uh, catalog of events that uh, LIGO has recently put out. Uh, and so one could calculate the log odds ratios with respect to the low isotropic benchmark. And one finds that, uh, you know, at least for the first 10 events, and I'm not gonna tell you, uh, it's not looking as good uh, for the new events. Uh, you've got a preference, a statistical preference for the spin distribution of uh, primordial black holes, I want to believe. And these slides, by the way, are all thanks to uh, Nico Fernandez. So one then should ask, okay, what should I see? 
uh, as well, the order of black holes, and you expect the odds ratios of other possibilities to quickly decrease, and with a given significance to eventually be able, just using the spin to discriminate PBH from sort of astrophysical distributions. Uh, and of course, you can play the same game for different, uh, for different truths. Uh, so what about mixed models? What about models where you've got part PBH and part astrophysical black holes? Well, again, uh, you know, you can build a statistical model that tells you what is the favored fraction of PBH in your sample. Uh, and so here, for instance, uh, I show you what the current preferred fraction of PBH is. Uh, and this depends on what you believe the rest of the, of the events look like. Uh, if you believe that they are um, uh, that they are in categories different from the low and isotropic, you see that there is a strong preference for a large fraction of PBH. Uh, and again, as you increase the statistics, uh, in this case, the truth is a 0.5 uh, fraction of PBH. As you increase the statistics, uh, you see a preference that is stronger and stronger for uh, the right number. Of PBH. Now, of course, you know maybe there's there's new physics that actually gets in the way and that fakes uh, the fact that these uh, merging black holes seem to have a really low intrinsic spin. Uh, and one such mechanism that has been considered in the past is super radiance. Uh, the idea here is that uh, if you have a light sort of axial light particle, you can radiate it and uh, you can jettison angular momentum in the process. Uh, in sort of exactly the same way that uh, you've got, uh, you know, radiative emissions uh, from electromagnetic bound states. Uh, so here, the idea is that once you fix the mass of the light species that you're considering for, for your super radiance, uh, you've got an excluded region in the plane of masses versus spin of your black holes be them astrophysical or primordial, doesn't matter. Uh, you cannot be above these curves in what is known as the Regge plot. Uh, and I worked really hard to convince my collaborators, uh, Akshay and Fernandez, that this was Regge plot and not Regge plot. Uh, but I guess they're big fans of music and uh, they could not be corrected. Uh, anyways, as you can see here, uh, you do have a preference for certain masses uh, of the radiated um, uh, super light particles. The problem is that we also know of black holes uh, in X-ray binaries that have actually very large spins. Now, uh, and this is uh, especially thanks to Akshay Galsazi, who's really a believer. Uh, Akshay pointed out that, well, these uh, X-ray binary black holes are actually quite massive. Uh, and so they could get stuck uh, as they shed angular momentum in large uh, orbital uh, uh, angular momentum uh, states such as L equals two or uh, L equals one. And if that's the case, uh, because they're massive, super radiance is not as efficient. Uh, and interestingly enough, uh, we found that for specific masses of the light uh, particle that you can super radiate, a lot of these X-ray binaries in the regge plot actually fall on the exact values that we predict for L equals one and L equals two, again. I want to believe, Akshay certainly wanted to believe. Uh, and again, you can do sort of a statistical treatment and find what is uh, the posterior probability distribution for your axial light particle mass. And we find that, you know, something in the range of 10 to the negative 11.7 electron volts uh, works really well to explain why the observed uh, mergers of primordial black holes at LIGO uh, have such little angular momentum, has such little effective spin. Now, let me go back to why this plot is wrong. Uh, and let me focus in particular on this region of light, of light primordial black holes. So this was uh, constrained uh, by a variety of observations in its original incarnation, including this big constraint from uh, observations with optical telescopes, with in fact a Subaru hypersupreme camera of stars in Andromeda, in the M31 galaxy. Uh, looking for microlensing events triggered by the passage of primordial black holes along the line of sight. So in figure one, these constraints are very, very aggressive. There's also constraints from white dwarfs and neutron stars that could capture black holes and, and get destroyed. 
examples. This is the of the Subaru paper uh, where these constraints from white dwarfs and neutron stars have disappeared correctly because uh, as it turns out, they were very, very optimistically calculating uh, the capture rate of primordial black holes. So those, those constraints are certainly not there. Uh, and uh, people realized that for light enough primordial black holes, the wavelength of light, the wavelength of light that you're using uh, to look for microlensing is actually the same length as the Schwarzschild radius of the primordial black holes. Uh, and so, you know, you cannot have microlensing. You have diffraction effects that completely prevent you from observing a microlensing effect. And so the constraints went from this dashed line to that uh, solid line. Finally, there is a version three where the constraints become even more conservative because folks uh, realize that there's also finite size source effects. Uh, and I'll get to that uh, later. However, these finite size source effects they depend on the fact that a star in Andromeda uh, compared to the size of the lensing effect uh, in, in angular units is large. In other words, your lensing effects are smaller than the size of the source. Uh, and this was taken into account in this version three paper of the uh, HSC observations. However, assuming that all stars have the same radius and that radius be uh, the radius of the sun. And the sun is a fairly small star in this context. Uh, by the way, the phantom lensing constraints also because of finite size source effects do not exist either. So what we asked with uh, Nolan Smith, who's uh, a fantastic junior graduate student in my group uh, was, well, you know, among all of the assumptions that they make, does the assumption that all stars have the same size uh, and that size being set to one sort of radius make sense or not? So here, uh, you know, the truth of the matter is that you have to be very careful uh, and you have to look at which size stars you can be sensitive uh, with observations of, uh, of Andromeda with the hyper supreme camera. Uh, and it turns out that if you put that together with stellar population synthesis models for Andromeda, which we did in collaboration with Raja Gutahurta, who's an astronomer here at Santa Cruz, an expert on M31 stellar populations, we found the stars are actually much, much bigger than uh, the sun. And you see here, uh, a distribution, a statistical distribution, the size of stars uh, as a fraction of the observations uh, as a function of radius. So why are finite size source effects so important? Well, the idea is simple. If you uh, have a microlensing effect, what happens is you are lensing light that would otherwise not get to your telescope. Now, the problem is that if your source is very large, then you're lensing light that would, in any case, get to your telescope. Right. Uh, and so you obviously suppress significantly your ability to set constraints uh, using microlensing. Uh, and here's what it looks like. Uh, so these are the constraints calculated with all stars set at one sort of radius. And the constraints shift uh, as you consider bigger and bigger stars. Once you average over the actual size of the population of stars in that sample, this is what you get. And so let me draw your attention to the fact that now this really looks very different plot from what Bernard Carr had in 2017, because there's a huge swath of parameter space where primordial black holes certainly can be the dark matter. And this swath covers many, many orders of magnitude. So the question is, how do we go after them? Uh, and we are working on that. It's not easy because microlensing is essentially out of the question. Uh, and and so you got to be inventive. And one possibility that we're exploring with Ben Lemon and some undergrads is that you can capture primordial black holes in binary systems, such as pulsar binaries, and then use gravitational wave information from pulsar binaries uh, being perturbed by the capture primordial black hole to sort of constrain this. Uh, in addition to this, there's also a hope that in this region here where black holes evaporate, we can do better than uh, what people currently are considering. So let me focus on that region first. So first of all, what is the mass of a black hole that is evaporating today? Well, the mass is about 10 to the 15 grams. So we're talking about light asteroids or heavy pyramids. Uh, and the associated Hawking temperature is about 10 MeV. If you're hotter than 10 MeV, you evaporate too quickly. Okay, so it's critical here to look at what we have observationally. 
is don't have much. Uh, current telescopes such as Egret and Fermi uh, don't really get quite there. Uh, and so what we did in collaboration with Adam uh, Coogan, who's a postdoc in the Netherlands, and by the way, he's on the job market, he's fantastic, uh, and uh, Logan Morrison, uh, was to explore what happens in detail to the emission of particles uh, through Hawking evaporation. And what we found was that people tend to use a code Black Hawk that is not quite right. So what Black Hawk does is it calculates uh, the yield uh, in evaporating species using extrapolations uh, from program simulations like Pythia and Herwig uh, that are good at a GV scale, but not at a MAV scale. Uh, what Blackhawk does very well is, however, to go beyond the so-called geometric optics approximation for calculating so-called gray body factors in the evaporation. So we took that from Blackhawk, and then we corrected the Blackhawk prediction, which you see here in these red dashed lines, by actually calculating species by species what a black hole of this uh, Hawking temperature radiates. So for example, at 20 MeV, you actually have steam to produce pions. Uh, at 3 MeV, uh, you're going to produce uh, fewer pions, but you radiate uh, from internal bremsstrahlung a lot of, of the electrons and positrons that you copiously produce and so on. So the corrections are huge, um, and, uh, and it's important to take them into account to calculate uh, real performances of experiments in setting constraints and evaporating black holes, and that's what we did here. We realized that actually one existing telescope, Comtel, is uh, what does things best. And so these are uh, the updated constraints that uh, I invite you all to consider uh, when talking about uh, evaporation of primordial black holes. Uh, also, so Stefano, put, Stefano you, have, uh, you have around five minutes, okay? Sounds good. Thanks, Rogerio. Uh, and, and, uh, and what we pointed out was that new MEV telescopes uh, will have definitely the potential uh, to discover Hawking evaporation. Uh, and in particular, we're very passionate about this thing called Gecko, not only for its name, and we're working with, uh, with uh, experimentalists at Goddard, uh, NASA Goddard uh, Space Center to come up with a good science case for this thing to fly soon. So we heard uh, from Nicolas uh, that primordial black holes can be produced, uh, uh, can produce, sorry, can produce dark matter uh, from their evaporation products. Uh, so in this paper back in 2018, uh, again with Logan Morrison and with Yan Yu, uh, we've explored this possibility in addition to the possibility that you could also do baryogenesis uh, through Hawking evaporation. Uh, and uh, thanks to the fact that one of my grad students, John Tamanas, is Greek-American, speaks Greek fluently, uh, we came up with this neologism, melanopogenesis, the genesis uh, from uh, dark uh, holes uh, in Greek. And so uh, I'm not going to go through this because essentially this is what Nicolas was talking about. Uh, so if you have light enough black holes, they evaporate on time scales that are much shorter than the age of the universe and much shorter than one second. So the benchmark for, uh, for you not to screw up with uh, Big Bang Synthesis. And this is exactly uh, the identical plot that he had um, uh, where I I'm showing as a function here of the mass of primordial black holes that are evaporating and of the dark matter, and, and as a function of the number of internal degrees of freedom carried uh, in the dark sector, uh, where constraints are. And again, this is fairly similar to what Nicolas was pointing out. The difference here is really that, uh, unlike what I said, this is not the same plot. Beta is the same beta, uh, but he had here uh, the initial temperature um, uh, that instead for us, uh, is set by the mass of the evaporating primordial black hole. Uh, so we assume that, uh, that that is the initial temperature of the universe corresponds to the Hawking temperature of those uh, evaporating black holes. And again, you can produce uh, the dark matter and the baryonic symmetry at the same time in this scenario. So we also consider the possibility that evaporation at some point stops and you're left with some Planck scale relic uh, and so there's a possibility that the dark matter is formed in part by stuff that has evaporated from primordial black holes and in part by the relics of primordial black hole evaporations that shed all of their mass and then stop evaporating because maybe uh, of quantum gravity effects or maybe because they have a relic charge. In fact, the possibility of a relic charge is 
other uh, same guy, Ben Lemon, uh, is, is, is a distinct possibility. Uh, so the possibility is that you shed charge asymmetrically in the process of evaporation, and that uh, you are stuck with some electric charge when your event horizon shrinks to zero and when evaporation stops. Uh, so you reach extremality and, and you shut down evaporation because of that. Uh, that is a plausible possibility. And in that case, uh, what you're stuck with is a bunch of charged primordial black hole relics. Uh, so again, this is a function of the mass of the relic is the fraction of charged primordial black holes. How do you go after this? Well, you can use direct detection experiments. You can use neutrino uh, detectors such as ICRIS or MACRO. Or even better, you can use paleo detectors, uh, which are uh, essentially uh, you know, crystals with a very, very regular structure uh, that would be completely altered by the passage of a massive charged particle uh, that would destroy in, in a detectable manner uh, the, the crystalline structure. So to wrap this up uh, and to prevent Rogerio from yelling at me, uh, let me conclude. So I talked about stellar mass black holes. Uh, the spins look a lot like primordial black holes, or maybe they're low because of some other new physics. Um, I talked about asteroid mass black hole. Uh, micro lensing is a lot trickier than we thought. Uh, and there's a big question of how to go after what we now know it's for sure uh, habitable region in, in the mass range of primordial black holes. Uh, I then talked about evaporating black holes and the best constraints here come from CompTEL after careful re-evaluation of the gamma ray spectrum from these objects. Uh, and there's a bunch of future MEB telescopes that can do very well in that area. Ton size or space gap black holes uh, are interesting because they can source the dark matter and maybe even the baryon asymmetry. And maybe they can also source charged Planck relics, which uh, let me call grain of salt or noceums black holes, which again, uh, are very likely to have an electric charge stuck on them and they are potentially detectable. So in the era of gravitational wave astronomy, the physics of macroscopic dark matter candidates, trans Planckian dark matter candidates offers many opportunities for the ingenuity of theorists and the craft of observers alike. Uh, and I thank you very much uh, for your attention. I'll stop here. Thank you very much, Stefano, for this uh, very nice talk. So we have time for questions before the uh, discussion session. So uh, Diego, please. Uh, uh, I just wondering what happened if uh, in the specific case of uh, relic monopoles from gram unification theory. Well, uh, so here's the deal. Uh, we are not talking about inflation in this context, unless inflation disrupts what we are talking about. Uh, all right, so my assumption is that if you have some sort of uh, unwanted relic that could overclose the universe, such as uh, you know, the, the objects that you uh, entertain, such as, for instance, uh, monopoles, uh, then what happens is you presumably have an inflationary period that uh, dilutes them away. Uh, and then, you know, black holes, evaporate. if that's not the case, if that's not the, ca <clears throat> the case, then you're stuck uh, with those relics as if inflation had never happened. Okay. Any other questions, Stefano? Raise your hand or just open the mic. So, um, so if not, uh, let's thank Stefano for his this very nice talk, and uh, we're going to start the discussion.